Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for braving, finally, fall to come out today. I know, couldn't get here soon enough. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. I have several events to tell you about. Uh, next week may be the busiest week that the Department of Archives and History has each year, but Friday of this week is the final screening in the Austin in the Welty Garden film series. We'll be showing Austin Land, which is a very funny one, at 6 o'clock. And in case of rain, not that it will, we will be going across the street to uh, Bellhaven University. So put that on your calendar. Those have been really fun. And we'll wrap it up this Friday at 6. Then next week, on Tuesday, October 23rd, at 6 p.m. here in this space, the Museum of Mississippi History will screen a half-hour excerpt of the new PBS documentary, Native America, and have a panel discussion with University of Mississippi anthropology professor Robbie Etheridge and Jay Wesley of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. So, hope we'll see you back here Tuesday at 6. Then, one of the Old Capitol Museum's most popular living history programs, Present Meets Past, will take place on Thursday, October 25th, from 5 to 8. At it, you will meet key figures who shaped the history of the site and the state, including Major General Fox Connor, Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Gandy, Architect Theodore Link, Potter George Orr, and journalist Ida B. Wells. So, hope we'll see you Thursday at the Old Capitol. That same evening in the Delta, at Winterville Mounds, the Quapaw Dance Troupe will perform traditional Native American dances around a bonfire. Again, that's at Winterville Mounds, and uh, I can give you details about that afterwards. And then finally, if you are up for a road trip in the other direction, on Saturday, October 27th at 10 a.m. at Historic Jefferson College, we'll co-host the 11th Annual Black and Blue Program that focuses on the African American experience in the Civil War. Um, there's a morning component for that and an afternoon component. The morning component will actually be staff members from the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum doing presentations on those museums down there. Then in the afternoon, there will be um, a USCT cavalry group and uh, monologues of uh, local African Americans during the Civil War. It's a great program. It's free as well at Historic Jefferson College, just to the north of Natchez. Starts at 10 a.m. on Saturday. And then next week, for History's Lunch, we'll welcome Tywo Gaynor, John Gibson, and Edie Green from Mississippi Public Broadcasting. They'll be here to screen the original MPB documentary, Fannie Lou Hamer, Stand Up. So I hope we'll see you for that. Today, we are delighted to have Kathleen Bond with us to present The Future of Natchez's Past, Decoding the Layers of Contested History. A graduate of, Miss, of Vicksburg High School, Kathleen McLean Bonds holds a BA in Art and Art History from the University of Mississippi, an MA in History from Delta State University, and has completed coursework at Louisiana State University for an MA in Art History and a PhD in United States History. She began work at Natchez National Historical Park in 1993, was named curator there in 2001, and became superintendent in 2005. In 2014, Kathleen was recognized by the National Park Service as Superintendent of the Year in the Southeast Region. Help me welcome Kathleen Bond. Thank you. Good afternoon. Is it working? Yes. Well, thank you all for coming out. I'm very happy to be here. And one of the things he didn't mention that I'm going to tell you is a very important milestone in my professional life is that in September of 1979, I started work in the basement of the Capers building as a clerk typist. <laughs> so haven't we come a long way from then? Look where we are now. <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, start off by uh, trying to get my technology together. And I'm going to throw out a quote you weren't expecting from Burt Reynolds. <laughs> so we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So we're going we're gonna to watch the bandit run here. We're going to talk a little bit today about Natchez history and how that history is promulgated and how that history is monetarized. So hold those things in, in, in your mind. This is what you weren't expecting me to show you. What do all of these aspects of the industry in Natchez have in common? From MPNL to International Paper to the Armstrong Tire and Rubber Company? Because to speak of these, we use the past tense. This is history. They're all gone. 
And so what does Natchez have if we don't have industry? We have tourism. And we have a tourism economy that has become economic development. And this is your basic math class. If economic development equals tourism, and tourism is largely based on history, then economic development is based on history, and that gets you to a pretty squirrely place. And so what I want to look at is what has that meant since tourism started in Natchez in 1932, and what does it mean now? Um, if you're interested, I have a bibliography posted over there by the coffee. I'm going to reference a number of scholars, and, and if it piques your interest, please grab one of those. To talk about this, how history has been used in tourism, I want to start by quoting Jack Davis in his book from 2001, Race Against Time, Culture and Separation in Natchez Since 1930. This is what Dr. Davis says. In a sense, Natchezians, like other Southerners, were prisoners of their history. It was a prison of which white women had been the architects and the builders, and from whose walls neither male nor female cared to escape. History provided the cognitive basis for a two-tiered social order divided by race. Dismantling the caste system, changing attitudes and perceptions would require not only rewriting history, but overturning it, if not escaping it. And so if the pilgrimage model of giving tours of big houses is what began and set a pattern for Natchez history, where are we today? Is that true for our offerings today? So today we're going to make a quick run through about 12 different locations in Natchez and see how they align with that early pilgrimage model or where they have deviated from it. Um, I also want to start by quoting Ted Owenby. I don't know how many of you know Dr. Owenby. He runs the Center for the Study of Southern Culture up at Ole Miss. And he wrote an essay for this wonderful book on Southern tourism. And I want to read you the title of his essay because I just love it. It is, uh, where is Ted? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen, but does anybody want to hear about them when they're on vacation? <laughs> And in this book, he actually quotes the eminent historian C. Van Woodward in 1958, who said, The features of the burden of Southern history are these, military defeat and its consequences, poverty, racial conflict, and guilt. And then Woodward, I mean, Owenby goes on to say, Are Woodward's categories just too depressing for tourists, most of whom are trying to escape limits and worries in order to relax and have fun? Does cultural tourism in the South have to choose between depressing honesty and cheerful lies, worst represented by the many pilgrimages to Annabella mansions that avoid serious mention of slavery? So that kind of lays out where we're going to be going today. Oops, I did it. You said I would. So we're going to start our first location. We're going back in time. And I'm going to use my laser pointer down to the right, the southeast corner of Natchez. This is the area for the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians. So chronologically, this is where our knowledge of Natchez history begins. And it took, it took me a while to start to sink in why this place is so important. Why it is a National Historic Landmark. Because when the European explorers came to North America, they, they found these mound complexes up and down the Mississippi River Valley, but only at one were the Indians still living there. Only at this one could they record their culture, which is what uh, Duprats did when he got to Natchez. And the tragic thing is that his ability to do that lasted less than 20 years because the French set up a trading post in 1714, and within 20 years, the Natchez were gone. But we'll talk about that more in a minute. So, but that's not the only important layer on this land. You look at Fatherland Plantation here, and after the Natchez were gone, it becomes a plantation. And it gets developed, and great wealth begins to go there. And by the 19th century, you have Adam Bingaman there with his cotton plantation and his thoroughbred racehorses. And he had the best trainer in the country, J.B. Pryor. And so when Lexington, the most important racehorse of the mid-19th century, who gave, he's a sire for all of 
thoroughbreds today, when he came to be trained, he was sent here. He was trained at Fatherland in Natchez. And Adam Bingaman's good friend, William John Minor, up here at Concord, likewise, was racing racehorses. He owned 60. And this is Farsalia, the racetrack. William Minor is writing for Sporting News. This, and, and these people were so wealthy. They were the wealthiest people of their day. And that's that layer of history. And then they died. And it went away. And then Miracle, well, they died because Adam Bingaman, I have to tell you one more good story about him before we go away. Adam Bingaman was, had a wife. He went to Harvard and fell in love with a girl from Massachusetts and brought her back home against her father's wishes, and she died. And after she died, he began a relationship with a free woman of color, and he had six children with her, and then they moved to New Orleans so that they could live together as a family. This fa fabulously wealthy planter and his family. And he raced his thoroughbreds at Mattery. This is a picture of the old Metairie racetrack, and that's Adam Bingaman standing right there. And in 1860s, the racetrack failed, and they built a cemetery. Look at the oval from the racetrack. So we lose that layer of history at the Fatherland Plantation, and then miracle of miracles, we get the Natchez Indians back. The Mississippi Department of Archives and History develops the site, conducts professional archaeology at the site, and brings the powwow back every summer. So we have resurrected that culture that had been lost. Our second site is back across town on the Mississippi River, where the French built their fort in 1716 and called it Fort Rosalie. Because they had defeated the Natchez in a series of war, they actually impressed the Natchez as laborers and made them provide materials to build the fort. So that's, the Natchez had been on the site, then we get the French layer. And then soon we get a settlement that pops up around there. And you get plantations that begin to be built. And as soon as you've got plantations being built, then you have to have a labor force. And then you begin to get enslaved Africans brought into the site. You see the layers that are building up on that landscape until 1729, when a, a violent event happened that almost certainly did not look like this. But the Natchez Indians in a in a in a one fierce strike, destroyed the fort, destroyed all the plantation settlements, killed more than 200 French people, almost all the, the men. They took the women and children prisoners. And then, of course, as we know they will, the French come back, and they run the Natchez out of the area. Many of the men were enslaved and sent to Saint-Domingue. Many of the, the women were just uh, imprisoned and sent away. So when they come back, they decided to build bigger and better at Fort Rosalie, and, that, and then they had to send progress reports back to France. So you can see how the earthworks are progressing. But an interesting thing here, if you look at this area right over here, you see that we have an enclosed de Negros. So this is where the African workforce that's building the second fort is held. They actually came out of New Orleans, and uh, Monsieur Darby is the Irishman who was contracted with to provide the workforce to build the second fort. So that was going on in 1730. Fast forward through the 18th century, and with the end of the French and Indian War, we get the British. With the end of the American Revolution, we get the Spanish. The Spanish go beyond the fort site, and they lay out a town, the town of Natchez. And then Beyond the Spanish, within a 20-year period, we get the cotton gin and we get steamboats, and we become American. And that's the birthplace of modern Natchez. And that's what sets up the Old South paradigm that will become the fodder for much of Natchez tourism. Um, this is a painting that was made by John James Audubon of bird fame of Natchez in about 1822. Here is that old French fort right here on the edge. It's been abandoned by 1820. But you can see this town has already been laid out. You can see the level of wealth that has already accumulated in this place based on that foundation of slave labor. You see this beautiful mansion of Clifton that's already been built on the north end of the parade grounds 
And this mansion, Rosalie, is about to be built right down here on the grounds of the old French fort. And there you see it. It would have looked up at Clifton up here across the, the, um, the parade ground there. Peter Little, who built this house, was a cotton broker. He made his money off of cotton that was produced by enslaved labor. Um, Rosalie is typical of the architectural wonders that will become part of pilgrimage, but what also is going on is downtown Natchez is growing up with cotton mills and cotton warehouses until the boll weevil arrives in 1907. And then the economy crashes. So then what's going to happen? The Garden Club ladies come to save the day. I'm going to read you a quote from a lady named Charlie Compton in 1929. Four tourists were spotted here in Natchez last year. If we preserve the architectural wonders we are blessed with, surely more will come. There we go. So these garden club ladies, many of them were very well educated. Many of them were very smart. They built an industry of tourism in Natchez. Um, this is Karen Cox, and she's written a number of uh, important things about tourism. And this is what she said in this book, Dreaming of Dixie, How the South Was Created in American Popular Culture. It was as if all of American mass culture had conspired to sell America on the romance and nostalgia of the Old South. And the town of Natchez, Mississippi stood to benefit from it because its homes and gardens were as close to the idealized Old South of America's imagination as one could get. This is even before Gone with the Wind. So this is where the, the 1930s is already taking us. But let's, let's think through this. This is an industry. If you're going to have something for people to see, you better have something to popularize it. And to have the greatest national scandal of 1932 in the Goat Castle murders was that thing. Because the Goat Castle murders, the scandalous killing of Jenny Merrill, and was it these crazy neighbors who lived in the ruin next door with the goats, or was it not? This was all over the newspapers, all over the country. Oh, and then, by the way, come to Natchez and see the old houses. And then, by the way, you can pay and tour this one, too. So this whole Southern Gothic thing got out there into the zeitgeist. you got to have a paved road to get them there. So then you're lobbying Congress to create the Natchez Trace Parkway. And you see, the, this is Rowan Fleming Burns, who was the matriarch, who was lobbying Congress to create this road, the road to yesterday. Well, where's yesterday? It's Natchez. And then you have to sell them gasoline when they get there. <laughs> um, Karen Cox also says, what appealed to white tourists from outside the region was the participation of local blacks in the role of servants. This was 1930s Mississippi. Being served by Mammy made white visitors feel as if they had received an authentic Old South experience. So I'm saying all that is context to get back to Fort Rosalie, which I haven't forgotten, because an entrepreneur named Jefferson Davis Dixon in 1940 had the idea that what you also needed to do was give them something else to do besides look at old houses. When they come to Natchez, they could tour Fort Rosalie. He rebuilt an authentic example of Fort Rosalie in seven or eight buildings and furnished it out of the State History Museum. And it was exactly like the French had built it. Except, of course, it was nothing like the French had built it. It was like the John Wayne forts in the movies. <laughs> but there it was. And then also in 1940, we get a Mississippi River Bridge at Natchez. So people can come from Texas now and bring their money to spend and not have to get on a ferry to get across the river. This is the Fort Rosalie site, and I, I apologize for the blurry postcard, but also at this time, a factory to manufacture wooden boxes was built on the Fort Rosalie site, and about 25 houses popped up for people to stay there. So the site is changing over time. And then something else happens. See, the National Park Service. This is where we come into the story. If you're coming down Canal Street, this is where that ruin of the old fort was sitting, 
But by the time those houses grew up, it kind of got lost. So people weren't sure that there was anything still left there. It was all grown up in trees. So a developer had an idea that this would be a, this bluff view overlooking the river would be a great place for condominiums. And so a local group energized and lobbied to have a national park created in Natchez. This was in the 1980s. And the National Park Service drew out a general management plan that said, you know, the fort site actually was the top of the bluff, this plateau where the box factory had been, and the water's edge. So all of that should be included in a Fort Rosalie site. So there's, we found out, once we removed the houses and the trees, that this wall of the fort is still there. Very rich archaeological resources are still there. But at the same time, casino gambling came to Mississippi. And so when the casino boat came in, guess where they docked? In that land that was supposed to be part of Fort Rosalie. And guess where they put their great big parking lot, where the box factory had been. So things don't always turn out exactly as though we plan. So the Park Service has opened the Fort Rosalie site to the public. We were about to install some wonderful wayside exhibit panels. We have restored the only building left from the old fort, and we will soon be doing some living history programming at that site. Back to pilgrimage. So here, you remember this from the Natchez Trace brochure? Travel the road to yesterday. Now they have a new one to go with it. Natchez, Mississippi, where the Old South still lives. There was a New Orleans newspaper man who came up with that slogan in the 1930s. Unfortunately, it hung around for the rest of the 20th century. And words have meaning. And they have power. See here, even advertisements for the Yola Hotel, where the Old South still lives. But I'm not saying it was all artifice. One of the complicated things about history in Natchez is its real stuff involved. These were the real houses being lived in by real people. There were no museum houses at that time. And many of those women, this is Eliza Connor Martin, are wearing the 1850s gowns that were still real. I happen to know from an oral history interview that she let the waist out from 17 to 20 inches to wear this dress. <laughs> and that brings us to Melrose, which was one of the very first houses to be included in the pilgrimage tours because there was so much real stuff there. The acreage, the buildings, the furnishings, the gardens were all still there. Come to Natchez where the Old South still lives. And you see, this is the one that's being featured on the front pages of magazines. But I will say, this is an artifice because at Melrose, the hostesses did not wear antebellum clothes. Mrs. Kelly had them in their Sunday best. Mel the Kellys at Melrose had the documentation done in photographs and drawings for the Historic American Building Survey in 1935. So they're doing real research. They're creating a real historical database. The other thing that was real was that you still had people like Jane Johnson at these houses who had been enslaved. So she becomes a part of the pilgrimage, but she was a real person who had lived at this site since the 1860s. So there was that layer that no longer exists. But we get to our next site, the city auditorium, and you start to see how things get twisted. Because John McMurrin built Melrose, and this is his son, John Jr. John McMurrin was from Pennsylvania. John McMurrin was one of the wealthiest planters, and they did not support the Confederacy. The wealthiest planters were Unionists. But his son joined the Confederate Army. It's complicated and it's messy, but at the city auditorium, the Garden Club ladies devised an evening entertainment called the Confederate Pageant. And so there was a series of historical tableau and dance movements that included African Americans in a singing role, and a queen, and a king, and a court. And it created a mythology that was sold to tourists. 
It's not that there were no Confederates in Natchez. General Martin and his House Montaigne are evidence that there were, but that was not the predominant feeling in Natchez. I'm going to quote Catherine Grafton Miller now because this is marketing brilliance. On the set of the filming of Gone with the Wind, one of our favorite publicity stunts was naming this lovely old Japonica at Melrose for Vivian Lee. We airmailed her dozens of these red blooms and she was photographed with the flowers, pictures being released in newspapers all over the country crediting the Natchez Garden Club and mentioning the pilgrimage dates. As a result, when Gone with the Wind was filmed, the crew came to Natchez to take the background shots instead of going to Atlanta. Flashes of brilliance. Alas, I cannot match that up with remaining camellias at Melrose. So the National Park Service has owned Melrose since 1990. Fort Rosalie and Melrose were included in the original legislation. What does that mean? It means extra scholarship to make sure that we're telling a real story. It means a diversity of staff, a diversity of stories, a new round of photography and drawings for HABs. Uh, we've had some wonderful interns from Jackson State and from Alcorn State University. We're training the next generation of scholars and uh, public historians. It means that our restorations have been based in careful research and investigations. And it also means that our programming is diverse in terms of living history, not only the stories we're telling, but who is telling those stories. It also means special programming like Michael Twitty, if any of you know this culinary historian um, who came to Natchez for, for Juneteenth one year and was at Melrose all day. And these are a couple of very important people. Many of you may recognize James Meredith, whose sister apparently dragged him down there and made him attend it. But this is Sir Seshab Heter C.M. Boxley. And we're going to have to talk about Mr. Boxley for a while because he is the epitome of grassroots history, of someone with a passion who can make a difference in how things are done. Forks of the Road slave market sat on the outside of Natchez after a public ordinance said that the slave traders could no longer sell on every street corner in town. They had to go out to the edge of town. And so here is St. Catherine Street, that goes out to the fork of Liberty Road and Old Washington Road, and it's located right there on the map. Second largest slave market in the Deep South. Only New Orleans had a larger market. I'm not talking about Charleston or Alexandria. And it's what was missing from the pilgrimage story all those years. The fact that human trafficking is what built the wealth that built the town. Um, unfortunately now, it looks like a textbook of urban intrusion. There's very little that you would understand there. With Sir Boxley's lobbying, there are some markers, interpretive markers. With his lobbying, the city has purchased some of the land, and we now have the legislation that this land will become part of the National Park next year. This is one of Sir Boxley's favorite sayings. Until the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. And so he's all about finding the lion's voice so the lion can tell its own story. At Forks of the Road, not only has he done the research and had helped with exhibits being created for the site, he also has traveling exhibits that people can see that will help people understand this system of enslavement on which not just Natchez, not just Mississippi, but our whole nation is built. A very different story is told at the William Johnson House, right here in the heart of downtown Natchez. And oddly, it is this white woman, Edith White Moore, who has helped bring that story to light. She was a journalist from Chicago who came to Natchez and was able to write some of the earliest narratives of the histories that were told in the big houses. But in the 1930s, she also became aware of a manuscript collection that was in the attic of this house right over here, up here in this area. William Johnson had been dead since 1851, and he epitomized the top of a social caste 
of free black people, free African Americans who lived in Natchez before the Civil War. There were about 200 in that community. They were mixed race for the most part. William Johnson was a slave owner himself. These facts put together create cognitive dissonance. They don't seem to make sense to us because if you're like me, if you grew up in Mississippi with a one drop rule, you think in binary terms. You're either a pure white person or you go in the African American box if you have one drop. And the world in the 19th century was much more complicated than that. And we have to get outside of our head to begin to understand what free people of color lived like, what their world was like, what they could do. They could be very wealthy people and what they couldn't do. They couldn't vote. They couldn't testify against white people in a trial. So it was a whole different set of rules. William Johnson was a barber. That's how he was trained. That's how he made his money. He had barber shops in Natchez. He had one in Port Gibson at one time. He also bought and sold people. He had his own plantation, hard scrabble. He kept a diary from 1835 until he was murdered in 1851. That diary stayed in the attic of the house until 1938 when Edith Wyatt Moore told LSU they needed to go buy those papers. And they not only bought them, but they put two scholars to work on them. And in 1951, the centennial of his death, they published this book, William Johnson's Natchez, The Antebellum Diary of a Free Negro. It's never been out of print. It's taught in college classes all over this country because not only does it show you the world of free people of color, it tells you day in and day out what's going on in a small southern town. This place was wild. <laughs> there were people caning each other, respectable judges. There were shootings. There were stabbings. Not even talking about what's going on under the hill. <laughs> it is some wild reading. Let me tell you what the editors wrote. A careful study of this collection, particularly the diary, will go far to correct the accidental misinterpretation or deliberate distortion that has characterized most literary and quasi-historical writing about the town of Natchez and its immediate vicinity. This is all the Moonlight and Magnolia stuff. The area has long been identified with the familiar literary stereotype of the antebellum South, large holdings in land and slaves, colonnaded mansions, imported furniture, and the rest of the plantation legend, all fused into a picture of an opulent, leisurely, and cultured way of life. The chief defects of this type of analysis are that, like many good stories, it lacks the pedestrian virtue of accuracy and completeness. <laughs> William Johnson's diary brought authenticity back to the Natchez story. And in 1990, it passed to the National Park Service, and in 2004, it was open to the public. This is William Johnson's daughter. So when I talk about free people of color and I talk about people of mixed race, you have to really ground truth what the image is that's in your head. Because then when we do living history at the William Johnson house, who portrays William Johnson's daughters? It's a complicated story. We have expectations in our head that we need to get out of our head, I think. So then, you remember, I showed you this slide, the Audubon landscape of Natchez in the early 1820s, and this beautiful mansion named Clifton that was sitting on the north end of the parade grounds. The Serge family that built Clifton were probably the richest people ever to come through Natchez. And like a number of this small cluster of rich families, they all intermarried and they all ended up owning each other's lands and all that kind of stuff. So what happened to Clifton? What is its story? Well, Vicksburg fell to the Union forces in July of, April, July of 1863. And then the Union forces marched south to Natchez. The Confederates did not defend Natchez because it was a Union town. We didn't have the railroad. There was no reason to. The town surrendered, what, four times? Um, the Union Army felt the need to build a very large fort north of downtown Natchez. 
and they blew up that mansion to do it. So that was the end of Clifton. But you know, the other thing the pilgrimage has never talked about are these guys, the guys who were in the U.S. Colored Troops, the guys who were in the U.S. Navy, the guys um, who almost, their numbers almost doubled the number of Confederate forces from the county. So if you think there were fewer than 2,000 Confederate troops from Adams County, there were almost 4,000 African-American troops who fought for the Union Army. Adams County voted against secession. That's, that's what things like the Confederate pageant twist and obscure. So with the Emancipation Proclamation, thousands of enslaved people came into Natchez. Some of them were seeking service to fight for their own freedom. Some of them were seeking protection from the Union Army so that they could not be re-enslaved. And so with the Civil War sesquicentennial, National Park Service staff, like Jeff Mansell sitting right out there, worked on uncovering this true story of the Civil War in Natchez. The most wealthy planters were the most ardent unionists. William John Minor at Concord Plantation was writing all the southern governors saying, please do not secede, this is a disaster. Aiding the Confederacy will only drag out the inevitable. We're going to lose slavery. We need to plan for it. Fort McPherson was dismantled almost as quickly as it was constructed. After the Civil War, Linton Avenue and Clifton Avenue were built up right through the middle of the fort, and it's one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in Natchez today. But we have to work to keep that fort in our brains. So you heard Chris talk about the black and blue event that's going to happen at Jefferson College. At the end of next week, here's our friend Sir Boxley again. Because after Forks of the Road, his great passion is the U.S. Colored Troops and making sure that we know about this piece of history where African-American men took agency for their own lives and fought for their own freedom. And he works to make sure that young people especially learn that story. So we get through the Civil War and we get to Reconstruction. And now we're into the sesquicentennial of the Reconstruction years. And this is, this is kind of a black hole. I didn't learn a lot about Reconstruction when I was in school. I don't know if y'all did or not. This is a new book that you need to read. Justin Barron's Reconstructing Democracy, Grassroots, and Black Politics in the Deep South after the Civil War. Guess where there was the highest political participation by black people after the Civil War? The Natchez District. He has identified over 400 men who in some fashion were involved in the political process. John Roy Lynch was emancipated by the Emancipation Proclamation. He had been enslaved at Taconi Plantation across the river and at Dunleith in Natchez. He was elected congressman, one of only four congressional districts to elect a black congressman during Reconstruction. And then there is Zion Chapel, African and Methodist Episcopal Church, which is on a corner downtown. And that's the church where Hiram revels was a preacher. Hiram Revels was a free man from North Carolina who came south to be the pastor at Zion Chapel AME Church. This was built to be the second Presbyterian church and then was sold to the AME congregation. He was only in the Senate for less than two years before he was tapped to become the very first president of Alcorn State University now. It was A&M. But the very first African-American to sit in either house of the U.S. Congress came from Natchez. And if we go forward another 10 years or so and move over just a couple of blocks up into the middle of downtown Natchez, we get to St. Mary Catholic Cathedral. It was up until the middle of the 20th century. And it is a beautiful edifice built in the 1840s. And it is an edifice where both races could worship together. William Johnson's family were Catholic. William Johnson's wife took each one of their children to New Orleans to be baptized at St. Louis Cathedral. But in the 1890s, things changed. In the 1890s, we got our new constitution that instituted racial segregation. We got our new state flag, and we got Confederate monuments popping up, including the park right behind St. Mary Cathedral. And so then we get Holy Family Catholic Church and a separate African-American congregation is formed just a couple of blocks away. 
But St. Mary becomes typical of other churches like Rose Hill Baptist um, and Beulah Baptist. They become um, anchors in what were new racially segregated neighborhoods. In Natchez, these are our National Register districts. So here's the river. And this is the Holy Family District that's around Holy Family Catholic Church. And this is the Woodlawn District. And it was this district in the early 20th century that was more of a middle class district. This is where Richard Wright's grandparents lived. And he writes about that house in Black Boy and burning the curtains down. In 2003, after an international paper plant closed and we lost over 640 jobs in Natchez, a group came together to form a community alliance and build walking trails. And we got some great grant money that allowed us to build some wayside exhibits, more than 80 wayside exhibit panels developed by committee. <laughs> that was interesting. But they not only go along the river and through downtown, they go all the way out St. Catherine Street through the African-American portion of town. So it's part of telling that more diverse story that many tourism tourists today are demanding. So what were people thinking about in 1960? We had back-to-back -back Miss Americas from Mississippi. And the second one was from Natchez, Linda Lee Mead. But other people were thinking about civil rights. And Zion Chapel, Holy Family, Rose Hill Baptist became the core institutions where civil rights activities were planned. Here we have Medgar Evers speaking at Zion Chapel at Annie Church when he was field secretary of the NAACP. Those plants that had come into Natchez after World War II had provided good middle-class jobs for black people and white people alike. But I can't begin to imagine the complications of having to maintain completely separate facilities in those plants because white people and black people couldn't work next to each other. They couldn't eat in the same places. They couldn't use the same restrooms. And we began to see extreme KKK activities in those plants. In fact, just as we had been one of the wealthiest places of America in the 1840s, one of the most effective black participation locations in Reconstruction, we became one of the most violent KKK places in the 1960s. And it came out of those segregated neighborhoods. So we'll go back to that Concord plantation that was next to the Farsalia racetrack. That's where Armstrong Tire and Rubber was constructed. This mansion burned in 1901. So some of the acreage was used for this plant. And this plant was a hotbed of KKK activity. In fact, in August of 1965, um, George Metcalf was getting into his truck at the tire plant. And that truck had been wired with the bomb. And the bomb exploded. He was not killed. He was severely injured. But the repercussions in the community about that is what ignited a major part of the civil rights movement in Natchez. Much of this activity has been chronicled by a journalist, Stanley Nelson, in his book, Devil's Walking, Klan Murders Along the Mississippi in the 1960s. He began going to cold case files and tracking them down and trying to figure them out. And in 2011, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. That was before, and those articles led to this book. But it gives you an idea of the kind of violence that was taking place in Natchez at that time. Here Charles Evers is working in the community trying to persuade people not to march, not to be violent, but to focus instead on economic boycott, which in 1965 was actually very effective in getting concessions out of the city of Natchez. And these were for simple things like using a surname and not calling African Americans only by their first name, calling someone Mrs and her surname, letting them be on the school board, letting them work as clerks in stores, simple, simple activities. And these were concessions that were granted as part of these actions. All right, wrong button. There we go. Here is the uh, National Guard trying to keep order in Natchez in 1965. Recognize Sir Boxley here? These guys were part of a group called the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And they also set a new paradigm for civil rights activity in Mississippi because these men were armed. 
and they went out on the streets to protect civil rights workers. Back to the city auditorium, you remember the Confederate pageant? None of these African Americans were allowed to go in that auditorium. It was strictly segregated for white people until October 1965 when those people decided they were going to march and they were arrested, more than 500 of them. And they filled the jails and so the police started taking them to the city auditorium and they filled the auditorium and then more than 200 of them were put onto school buses and driven all the way north to Parchman Penitentiary without being told where they were going, without having been charged with a crime, and they were tortured for four or five days until their friends and families could come get them. And then they came back to Natchez and nothing was said for 50 years until the city finally issued an apology in 2015. The NAPAC Museum was founded in 1990, and think about Sir Boxley's saying and the lion. Their motto is, we exist to tell our story. So this is grassroots history. These people are telling their own story. And it's in an old post office building, right on Main Street. Remember Concord Plantation, where the tire plant is, where the mansion had been. The newest on the Natchez pilgrimage tours it's called Concord Quarters. The mansion is gone, the kitchen and the quarters remain, and this is Debbie Cozy, the proprietor. The first African-American member of the Pilgrimage Garden Club, the first African-American owned house to be on a pilgrimage tour. She's changing the model. And then back to Fort Rosalie, where in the 20 years ago, the city built a visitor center alongside the colonnade to the old bridge across the river. The National Park Service has put inclusive exhibits inside this building and next year we will own this building as well. In 2016, Natchez celebrated its 300th birthday and the National Park Service celebrated 100 years. And so one of the projects that we undertook this year my historian Jeff Mantle is here with us in the room, was a social media effort that dropped a little piece of history onto Facebook and YouTube every day for the entire year. And they're still out there, you can still go look at them. And what, we've had more than two million views all around the world on these Natchez History Minutes. And one of the great things is that for narrators, we had more than 140 school children. So they become involved in history. So what are we going to do about these big old house museums? They don't fit well into our new patterns and paradigms about tourism and history. Well, there's some scholarship out there. There's some innovative things going on with historic house museums. We're, going to, we're trying new things, new experiences. There are other things like the state's blues trail. More young people come to Natchez on the Blues Trail. More European visitors come to Natchez on the Blues Trail. They're coming into New Orleans and going to Memphis. And if they're on the Blues Trail, they want some experience that's going to explain this racial stuff to them. They want some real answers. Oh, I did it again. I'm probably going to get a record for how many people somebody does that. So I'm going to end also with one of our other thriving industries, which is the B&Bs. And Ted Owenby had a wonderful quote about B&Bs, and I'm going to close with that and then take some questions. People who stay in bed and breakfast seem to be guests in people's homes. And the whole event becomes a kind of play about hospitality. The architecture, furniture, food, and conversation rely on categories of a tangible past. And the fact that one is staying there helps embody the past. The past is not a museum, a book, or a battlefield. We can sleep there and have breakfast. Thank you. So I'm told that if you have a question, please raise your hand and Chris will get you a microphone. No questions. Oh, sir. Um, thanks for that, Bruce. Um, 
exposition of your book. Um, I'm not sure whether or not you've completed your doctoral program, but if you've not, I would strongly recommend <laughs> Dr. Ted Owenby. He was the chair for my doctoral committee. Wonderful. So I, I think very highly of him. He's an excellent historian. Thank you. <clears throat> my question is, um, if my understanding is correct, uh, please feel free to correct me. Um, my understanding was that um, in, in, in Natchez area, um, there were, of course, a great majority of um, black people, slavery, and um, there were quite a few free blacks who actually owned slaves. And compared to the Delta area, where there's slavery as well, and, and the great majority of slaves are black, of course, but even though the numbers are greater in the Delta area, in the Natchez area, you have more free blacks who own slaves. Is that accurate? I think it is, and part of that may be the proximity to New Orleans. Natchez is very close by river to New Orleans, where there were many thousands of free blacks. And so I think that proximity has a lot to do. In many ways, Natchez is more Louisiana than it is like the rest of Mississippi. Uh, would you comment, please, on the Jewish experience in Natchez? Absolutely. And I will say that uh, I just ran into someone yesterday who was discovering, uh, discussing the uh, ongoing renovations at the temple in Natchez. After the Civil War, there were a number of merchants um, who came to Natchez from uh, Eastern Europe, from the Alsace-Lorraine region, and a very large Jewish community grew up in Natchez. And these merchants also became um, lenders to the plant planters themselves, so then they often became plantation owners. And so by the turn of the 20th century, there was a very strong Jewish community inside of Natchez. In fact, the pilgrimage queen that I showed you was a woman of Jewish descent. And unfortunately, they were hit very hard by the boll weevil because they were holding a lot of that outstanding debt at the turn of the 20th century. And so over the course of the 20th century, the temple that's in Natchez is a wonderful architectural remnant, but the community itself has shrunk very small, but it's a very important part of Natchez history. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Chris. Thank you. I am from Natchez, Mississippi. I was born and reared there. And I wanted to know, did you know anything about the Rhythm Life Club? Yes, it, I do. Um, and I'm, I know Monroe and Betty Sago very well who are running the museum there. Uh, the Rhythm Night Club was sitting right there on St. Catherine Street across from Holy Family Catholic Church. And it was, uh, it was a prominent nightclub in that region and attracted some very um, important bands back in the late 1930s. And in 1940, there was a band from Chicago playing there and, and a tragic fire broke out. And most of the exits had been sealed and people were not able to get out and more than 200 people died. And there is an on-site museum there now so that people can learn. And they also do a very memorable anniversary uh, commemoration on April 23rd every year at that museum. There is a monument on the bluff as well. That's true. Uh, well, the, the monument was erected by the Natchez Club of Chicago because as part of the Great Migration, so many African Americans had already left Mississippi at that time. And I'm, I read just, I'm reading that wonderful book by Isabel Wilkinson right now, that more people, more African Americans lived in Chicago than in the state of Mississippi at that point. So thank you. I expected to hear at least a mention of Abdul Rahman Ibrahim and 
it's not in your story, but I think that's a, a very interesting story for Natchez. It is a fascinating story. It's just um, Chris was already freaking out about how many slides I had, <laughs> so I had to, I had to limit a little strong. bit. But um, you know, we, we know him as as the prince. Um, and, and the story of this African prince who was sold into slavery and then years later encountered on the streets of Natchez a man who had known him in his royal statue back in, in Western Africa is an amazing story. And we still have his descendants who live in town. But it gives us a glimpse in the, again, Africa is a continent. It is an enormous place. It is not monolithic. There's so many individual stories to be gleaned there. This is an excellent presentation. The Mrs. Johnson in the early pilgrimages, who was a slave, had come out of slavery. Yes. Was her story recorded? I have never seen her words. She has some descendants, but unfortunately they don't, they come to us to ask for information. So she is buried in the city cemetery, but I don't know a lot about her personal life. So her grave is marked? Her grave is marked, yes. Could I ask a question about the Whitney uh, plantation in Louisiana and what they've, what they've done, if I understand it correctly? Well, um, Jeff has visited and I have not, so I hate to get him up to talk about it. What I know about it is it is a privately owned plantation site and much money has been invested down on the river road, has been invested in telling that story from the point of view of the enslaved people. And there are many wonderful bronze statues that have been used to bring humanity to that location. I understand it's a very moving experience to go there. It's on my list for this year. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, I've been trying to stay quiet. I'm another Natchezian. Uh, and so I, I grew up on, uh, on Washington Street mm -hmm. next to Tejada. Uh, tavern. So as a child, we, we snuck down and played at the old Fort Rosalie site. Mm -hmm. and you bad boys. <laughs> bad, <laughs> because the tower caved off the, the bluff not, not long after that. But, and I understand the gentleman that he created the replica of the fort. I was delighted that, well, of course, I always knew that had to be where the fort was. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out that he was on the right location. He built it right slap on top of where it had but been. He, but he had two two other tourist destinations that weren't exactly accurate, like where he identified uh, the Devil's Punch Bowl mm -hmm. and White Apple Village. Right. Uh, but uh, I was trying to think where I was heading with it. But, but anyway, uh, we always, uh, of course, growing up there, you, you knew there were a lot of uh, stories that were told to give something nice to tell the tourists. <laughs> And, and uh, so kind of always uh, could grin about that, you know, that mm -hmm. we, we knew that that wasn't exactly uh, the case. But anyway, I do, did appreciate your presentation. Thank you. I think this is the last one we'll have time for. Kathleen, I was gonna tell you about a, a historical resource that I discovered it's in the public library in New Orleans near the city hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a microfilm roll. And it's the Harbor Master's record book. And in there, it talks about all the different boats that parked on the levee in New Orleans. And it gives the name of the boat and who owned the boat. And from the names of the boats, you kind of can kind of get their political sentiments. And also, the description of the boats, I don't really quite understand. Some of them were called bateaux, or some were called barges and flatboats. And anyway, I recognize some Natchez names ah. uh, and those boat owners, Thank like you. Jose Vidal. Yes, of course. That was great. Thank you all for coming to today's program. The hour flies by. Help me thank. Kathleen, for this wonderful talk, and I am sure if you have more questions or comments, she'll be glad to speak with you up here afterwards.